as I was thinking about that, uh, what God was showing me this week, this, this pertains so much to what Bex and I are going through in our lives um, with different family situations and different things that are going on. This, it just seemed to apply so much, so I very much felt like God was trying to tell me something. Uh, so hopefully he'll be trying to tell you something with this one <clears throat> today as well. I'm going to start out with a mashal because I love to start out that way. It's a perfect way to get you on the mindset of where I want you to be. This particular mashal starts in a small village in ancient Israel. There were two brothers that lived there who were known for their extraordinary bond and kindness. They each owned a farm on opposite sides of a hill. The older brother was single and he lived alone, while the younger brother, he had a large family. One night, the older brother laid awake thinking, this reminds me so much of what my brother would do. Part of the reason I love this mashal so much. The older brother laid waking, thinking, my younger brother has so many mouths to feed. He has children, his wife, and himself. He surely needs more grain than I do. Moved by love, he secretly took a sack of grain from his barn, and under the cover of darkness, he quietly placed it in his brother's barn. Meanwhile, the younger brother was thinking, my brother is alone, and he has no one to take care of him in his old age. Surely he needs more grain than I do. He needs this to ensure his security. That very night, he took a sack of grain and stealthily placed it in his older brother's barn. This mysterious exchange, it went on for many nights. Each morning, both brothers were puzzled to see that their supply of grain was unchanged. One night, under a bright full moon, they bumped into each other. Each one on their mission of kindness. At that moment, they realized what had been happening. They dropped their sacks and they embraced each other in a tearful hug. The sages say that God witnessed this scene and he declared this place where the brothers meet in selfless love is truly holy. And according to tradition, it was on this very spot that the holy temple in Jerusalem was destined to be built. This mashal, brothers and sisters, it teaches us the importance of selflessness and anticipating the needs of others. It shows that acts of kindness and empathy, they aren't only beneficial to those who receive them, but they're also beneficial to the world around us. The brothers' actions exemplified the Jewish value of chesed, meaning loving kindness, where a person goes beyond their duty to understand and care for the needs of others. In chapter 41 of Bereshit, which we heard this morning, we read about the account of Yosef being summoned by the interpreter or being summoned to interpret Paro's dreams. Paro had two dreams that troubled him, and he wanted to understand them. If we remember from Parashit Maquettes, the one that we're reading today, the first dream was of seven thin and ugly cows who had eaten seven fat and healthy cows. Paro's second dream was of seven thin and withered ears of grain swallowing up seven healthy and ripe ears of grain. Once Pyro's royal cupbearer learned that no one could successfully interpret the dreams, he remembered Joseph's dream interpreting abilities, and he passed on the reference to Pyro. In Bereshit 41.15, we read it this morning, Pyro said to Joseph, I had a dream. Don't start singing, because I know we're all going to think Joseph and the multicolored dream cut. It's not what he meant. I had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. We see here that Paro only asked for an interpretation from Yosef. Yosef does that. He obeys what Paro wants. But after giving the interpretation, Yosef took it upon himself to offer some unsolicited advice. As we see in Bereshit 41, 33 to 36, he says this, Therefore, Paro should look for a man, both discreet and wise, to put in charge of the land of Mitzrayim. Paro should do this, and he should appoint supervisors over the land to receive a 20% tax on the produce of the land of Mitzrayim during the seven years of abundance. 
They should gather all food produce during these good years coming up and set aside grain under the supervision of Paro to be used for food in the cities, and they should store it. This will be the land's food supply for the seven years of famine that will come over the land of Mitzrayim, so that the land will not perish as a result of the famine. You know, when you, when you think about this and you look at what Joseph said to Paro here, most of us, if we were standing in front of a king, we would only do what we're told. You know, we would do immediately what he asked us to do. But we see here, brothers and sisters, that Yosef was unique. He was unique here. Yosef not only identified and articulated a problem, but he also anticipated a need and he had the courage and the zeal to do what was necessary to help resolve the problem. So the lesson that we can learn from this parish all today is that if we're ready to give advice on how to fix a problem, we should also be just as willing to be used by Adonai to take tangible steps to be a part of the solution. There's so much to fix if you think about our world. There is so much to fix to make right and to change in our world. And there's certainly no shortage of people who can point out all the problems that exist. Many of these people are eager to share their cynical views on a wide variety of topics. But how many of these people are just as eager to offer up solutions and are willing to roll up their sleeves and take steps to resolve the problem? There's not very many brothers and sisters. In connection with this subject, a writer by the name of Adam Lieberman, he once wrote, this is quite interesting, the tendency to be problem-oriented and not solution-oriented usually parallels our own lives. It's not that we proactively to choose to focus on negative things, although a lot of people do just that, but negativity and problems are just the default thoughts for our brains. Our minds can be likened to a garden. Whatever seed you plant in a garden, that seed will grow. But if you don't plant anything in the garden, then weeds will grow in the garden. Our minds work the same way. Absent of our thinking of productive thoughts, our minds will naturally drift towards something negative and unproductive. People who are moving and growing tend to have more positive and productive thoughts, while those who are stuck and not moving will usually focus only on negative thoughts. It's through seeking Adonai's kingdom, through following Yeshua, through studying his word and seeking to keep his mitzvot, that we will pull out the noxious weeds in the gardens of our minds. You know, many times, I think a lot of us feel qualified to give criticism. I think that's just a natural human reaction. We just think, well, I'm qualified, definitely qualified to give criticism. But we don't feel qualified or motivated to help make the necessary changes. But in our parish, all we see not only did Yosef point out the problem, but Yosef also accepted Paro's commission to make the necessary changes in Mitzrayim, and he took action to avoid the coming disaster. And one of the main points I want to make today, and one of the primary questions I want to ask you today is, do you think Yosef had all the necessary skills that he would need to do this? Think about who he was. Think about where he had come from. He was basically a shepherd boy whose brothers took him and threw him into a pit. He was sold into slavery into Mitzrayim. This is not a guy who knew a lot. Wasn't the greatest, greatest educated guy. So do we think he had the skills to actually accomplish what Paro had asked? You see, he probably wasn't qualified to take on such an enormous responsibility. But here's the difference between Yosef and you. He did it anyway. He did it anyway. This, brothers and sisters, is where faith comes in. You see, often we may not feel like we're equipped to do something for Hashem. Or we may feel like we couldn't possibly 
be of any help in a certain situation. But brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, if that's what you feel today and that's where you are, and oftentimes I feel that way, I do not feel equipped to be stood up here today. I don't, if I'm honest. In and of myself, I'm not. I know that. But brothers and sisters, if that is the way you're feeling, I want to say that you're in good company today. Because there was another man who felt the same way. If you remember Moshe, he felt exactly the same way. Moshe identified a problem of his people, Yisrael, who were in Mitzrayim. But he didn't feel like he could possibly be a part of the solution. And you'll recall Adonai asked him to become the agent of change for deliverance. But Moshe didn't feel like he could do that. How could I do that? In Shemot, Exodus 4, 10 to 12, this is what Moshe says to Adonai. Moshe said to Hashem, Oh, Adonai, I'm a terrible speaker. I always have been. And I'm no better now, even after you've spoken to your servant. I still am a horrible speaker. My words come slowly. My tongue moves slowly. But listen to the beautiful answer and response of Hashem. This is, this is how Hashem works. Hashem answered him, who gives a person a mouth? Who makes a person dumb or deaf, keen-sighted or blind? Isn't it I, Hashem? Now therefore go, and I will be with you and your mouth, and I will teach you what to say. Now we look at this parish, all we see that Mitzrayim, it was the ruling nation in the world during Yosef's time. And we see that Paro, he took Yosef and he made him second in charge over Mitzrayim. You've got to remember, Mitzrayim controlled the entire world. And here is Yosef being put in second in charge. For Yosef to be second in charge and second in command, the second most powerful person in all the world at that time, it makes sense that he would have needed to have some very basic skills to be successful. And one of those skill sets would have been the basic skill of language. Because Mitzrayim was the world power. This meant that the world came to Mitzrayim. This is where everybody came to do business. People from every nation, every tongue would come and they would interact with the kings and the rulers of Mitzrayim. And these rulers would have been, they would have needed to be familiar with several languages. How did Yosef deal with this? He's not equipped to do this. He's a shepherd boy, for goodness sake. How does he deal with this? The Jewish sages give us a little bit of insight as to how they believe he dealt with this. Listen to what they say. The Jewish sages tell us that Malek Gavrael, the angel Gabriel, was sent to teach Yosef the languages. But when he wasn't able to learn them, it is explained that the way Adonai shouldered this burden, how many people know this, was by adding a letter to the name of Yosef which then empowered him with the skills he needed. How many people know there was another letter added to Yosef's name? He had a name change, brothers and sisters. He had a name change. Most of you don't know it because it's not in your Bibles. It's not in most of the translations. King James, probably ESV, ASV, they don't, they don't show it. But let me show you. You see, in the same way, it's when we allow God to have control to alter our lives that we're able to accomplish the impossible, which is exactly what Yosef did. This interesting tradition that, added, that Adonai added a letter to his name, to the name of Yosef, further enabling Yosef, it stems from the Tanakh. You won't find it in the Brit Chodeshah. It comes from the Tanakh. And specifically, it's found in Tehillim 81, verses 5 and 6. Listen to what it says. He appointed it in Yahoseph, for a testimony, when he went over the land of Mitzrayim, I heard a language that I didn't know. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. You see, most English versions in this passage, they don't include the letter H. The letter H that comes from the Hebrew letter A in Yosef's altered names. But all we need to do, brothers and sisters, is read the Hebrew version. 
of this text, and you'll see that the letter He is in fact added there with the immediate context of what? It's added with the immediate context of Adonai miraculously intervening to help Yosef understand language. Understanding language. This should teach us, brothers and sisters, that Adonai doesn't always expect someone to already possess the necessary skills that they need for them to be used in a meaningful and powerful ways. All we have to do is be a willing instrument in God's hand. You know, like the brothers in our mashal this morning, Hashem is just waiting to find someone who will anticipate the needs of his kingdom so he can empower that person to succeed. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of Hashem run back and forth throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him or complete towards him or completely his. You know, for some of you out there today who may be watching on YouTube or Facebook or wherever you might be watching today, you know, there may be no Messianic Kahila where you are, Messianic community where you are. And maybe what God is calling you to do today is take a step of faith, step out in faith, even when you feel un uh, like you have no ability to do it. You don't feel empowered to do it. You don't feel like you are, 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 are in the position that you can stand up in front of people and try to share what God is sharing with you every day, even when you don't feel that, brothers and sisters. Maybe he's telling you, you need to take a step of faith today and start a kahila in your area that needs one. You know, for some of you that do attend synagogues regularly, we have a lot of people who watch online every week, and I know you go to other congregations. For some of you, it might be anticipating the needs of your congregation. And the community there, such as anticipating your brothers and sisters' needs within your communities, but not just anticipating, taking steps to help. There may be even people in your neighborhoods. Maybe they don't say it out loud. Maybe it would, maybe it would mean we need to pay attention to what's going on. But maybe there's people in our neighborhoods that don't have enough money to buy food or the necessities that they need that you could help with. It could be something as simple, and obviously we don't have a, a weekly kind of meeting place, but if you do, and you're watching me today, it could be something as simple as seeing that your congregational place, it's in need of a good clean. And you take the steps to go and help clean it. Or you see where your neighbor's house needs maintenance, the gutter's falling off. And you take steps to help. You reach out and you try to help people proactively before you're asked to do it. Or in your family. It could be that you anticipate that someone like your parents are in need of help. Whether you live with them or not, and you go out of your way to relieve their burdens. And for some, it might be things that are much greater than these examples that seem to be beyond your ability, beyond your means. For some of you, maybe it's even along the lines of something that, like Yosef went through. Maybe Adonai wants to use you to change and direct a nation. The list could go on and on, brothers and sisters, but my point is, as people of God and followers of Messiah Yeshua, we want to be characterized as people who become part of the solution, not part of the problem. In doing this, brothers and sisters, we fulfill the commands to love both God and our brothers. In Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Yeshua the Messiah, he said, you are to love Hashem your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the greatest and the most important mitzvah. And the second is similar to it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. All of the Torah, 
all of the Torah and prophets are dependent on these two mitzvot. You see, when we anticipate the needs in the kingdom of Adonai, and we seek to fulfill them, this is one way we feel, fulfill the great commands in loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And it also fulfills the command of loving your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew 23, verses 3 and 4, Yeshua, speaking to some of the parashim and the Torah teachers, he said, So whatever they tell you, take care and do it. But don't do what they do because they talk, but they don't act. They tie heavy loads on the people's shoulders, but won't lift a finger to help carry them. There's a couple of things I want to point out in this particular verse. The first is how he starts this verse. Yeshua, the very first thing out of his mouth is, so whatever they tell you to do, take care and do it. Take care and do it. Now, I thought, or at least this is what I've been told, when Yeshua came, all this stuff is done away with. I thought when Yeshua came, all of this listening to the parashim, listening to the rabbis, none of that matters anymore because don't they understand that he's the, he's the sacrifice for all mankind, for all eternity? Yet here we see that the Messiah himself instructs the people, do what they tell you to do. Why? Because what they were teaching was Moses. They were teaching the law of Moses. They were teaching the Torah to the people. Hashem is, or, or Yeshua here, is confirming yet again, make sure that you're obeying the commands by listening to what they tell you and do it. But the problem that he explains with these people is they don't do it. You see, there are two negative descriptions here that Yeshua uses to describe some of the religious people of his day. First, he says, and do you know anybody like this? First, he says they like to talk. They like to talk, but they don't like to act. Again, if we want to offer criticism, constructive or otherwise, we should be ready to act and to be a part of the solution. The second description that he gives is similar. He says that they tie heavy loads on the people's shoulders, but they won't lift a finger to help. You see, what he's trying to say in a roundabout way is this. It's not fair or lawful to lay a heavy burden of expectation upon someone unless you're willing to help that person bear that burden. This is what the parishim were doing at the time. They were creating what we call the oral Torah. They were creating the oral law, the rabbinical law. And they were telling the people, if you don't wash your hand three times a day, or if you don't stand on one foot and face Jerusalem, they were saying all these different things. And Yeshua is saying, none of that stuff matters. What matters is what my father has said. And all these other things that you're adding on, you're putting a burden on their shoulders. You'll recall there's a verse where Yeshua says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. This is exactly what he's referring to. I don't add things to the Torah. I simply say what my father has said. I don't give you extra weight for your shoulders. My burden is light. In conclusion today, the emissary Shaul, he teaches us in Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens. In this way, you will be fulfilling the Torah's true meaning, which the Messiah upholds you know as i sat and thought about where we are as a little group this week you know we got people spread out all over the place some sometimes when we have face to face we'll get a lot of people sometimes we can't because people are unwell and there's all these different kind of things but as i kind of reflected on where we've come over the past specifically three years you know i've been really encouraged I've been really encouraged to see over the past few years that on many occasions here in our little group, we've been used by Hashem to fulfill many of the needs that I've mentioned today. And as a kahila, as a little community, I think we've been pretty good at bearing one another's burdens. But as we move forward, brothers and sisters, 
And as we grow, we should seek to excel in this area and anticipate the needs of our community and the world around us. In Yochanan 13, verses 34 and 35, Yeshua teaches us, In the same way that I have loved you, you are also to keep on loving each other. Everyone will know that you are my disciples. Not by what you say, not even by what you do. How, how does he say you, they'll know you're my disciples? By the fact that you have love for each other. This love that Yeshua speaks of here, it was characterized by a sacrificial nature. In other words, brothers and sisters, it's not an easy love. It's not an easy love. It's a love that takes effort. It's a love that requires us to give up our own time, our own conveniences, and a lot of times giving up our own resources. It's an active love that looks for opportunities to be used by Adonai and trusts him for the ability to fulfill his will in our world. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what skills you possess or what resources you have. Just as Yosef did, if we see someone in our world that could use our help, we should trust that by taking the simple step of reaching out to that person, by taking that simple step of faith, God can work through our hands and he can add himself into the equation in a miraculous way. And when he does that, brothers and sisters, it will enable us to do his righteousness. And it will enable us to display his love to a world that is absolutely starving for it. We see this all around us today, brothers and sisters. As I say, some of the situations that we're going through as a family, I see a lot of the things that I've talked about today there as relevant, as pertinent. And it's a sad thing that as we look around the world, we see that people have become so internalized. Everything's about me. Everything's about how it's going to affect me. What, you know, if, if I give to that person, how will it affect what I'm able to get for myself? If I, if I give to the ministry, how's it going to affect how I can do this or how I can do that? See, a lot of the problem that we have is we've taken God out of the equation. We've forgotten that God is able to enable us. He can enable us to do whatever it is that we need to do to accomplish his purpose on this planet. And we've moved so far away from that. And it's a sad thing today. It's a sad thing. So, Brothers and sisters, as I close today, I just want to say, stop. Sometimes maybe just stop, maybe slow down. Maybe look around you. Maybe look at people that you think, no, they're fine. They're, they're absolutely fine. Maybe stop for a little bit. Look at those people. Take a closer look and see if that person actually needs some help. Maybe all they need is love. Maybe all they need is for somebody to say, keep going. Now, I've got a precious brother. Not brother by birth, but brother by the Messiah, Yeshua, who's in America, who has been an absolute God sinned in my life. There is, and I, and I say this, I say this with complete truth. There is no one else ever in my life that has impacted my walk and my faith than this brother. He has done more for my walk and my faith than I did in the first 20 years of my life. But he's struggling. He's struggling. He's a believer. He's a great messianic teacher, but he's struggling. Life has thrown curveballs at him. He's gone through difficulties. He's gone through struggles. Brothers and sisters, I make it a point in my life to say, keep going to him. Keep going. Even though he's the one that's taught me everything, I say to him, keep going. You must keep going. God is able. He is able. He can enable you. He can lift you up from a pit and he can make you ruler of the world. That is what he is able to do for us today, brothers and sisters. We've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. Start walking like it's true. 
even when it doesn't feel like it's true. Stand up anyway. Speak anyway. And just believe that when you open your mouth, God will enable you. He will enable you. Amen. Amen. Rukashem. Adonai.